Um, hello everyone, so yes, my name is Jed and uh, my background is in neuropsychology and that's actually what brings me here. So, um, last year I studied my masters in neuropsychology at Bath Spa and during that time I conducted a systematic literature review on how virtual reality is being used in neuropsychological care. Uh, to do this I had to review papers between, uh, that were published between 2014 and 2018, so at the time uh, kind of the most up-to-date papers that I could find and try to get an idea of how they're being used in therapy, you know, what's being researched. Uh, because my focus was neuropsychology as well, it's worth keeping in mind that most of the things I was considering at the time were uh, things like brain injury patients and stroke, so there was a fair amount of physical rehabilitation as, as part of this process. Um, so virtual reality kind of always interested me in this sense, and to explain why, uh, I will take you back to my graduation day. Uh, very happy day, and I remember standing with my mum, and she said, you know, I always thought you were going to really struggle at uni. Thanks, mum. She always said, you know, no, not, not academically, I thought you'd be fine. The reason I thought you'd struggle at uni is because, to be honest, you were kind of a bit of a loser before you went back to uni. Uh, you just, you spent all your time playing games at home. Um, I don't know if you've ever been called a loser by your mother on your graduation day, but something like that sticks with you for a bit. Um, and I think that that kind of prompted me, gently, we might say, to explore how video games in particular can be used positively. Because to me, I kind of, I felt like I had an inherent understanding of something that she didn't from growing up playing video games my whole life. And that is ultimately what led me to understand VR and the use of tech in care. So, uh, without further ado, um, today I want to go through what we classify as virtual reality in academia, because while we're all here at the Bath Digital Festival, I'm sure you all have an idea of what virtual reality is. Unfortunately, in academia, the, uh, the concept of virtual reality is a little bit less flashy than you might be expecting. Um, after that, I want to take you through some of the ways that virtual reality is actually being used in research at the moment, some of the ways that we are using VR in care, uh, whether, that's, whether that's actual VR as we know it, or VR as the way that academics will call it. I'm hoping that I can give you a bit of an idea of some of the interesting ways that we can use it. After that, I want to consider what counts as the next step in therapy and why I believe that VR is that next step. Um, and finally, there is a slight element of this talk that I believe that elderly populations in particular will be standing the most to gain from this new technology. And I know that that occasionally goes against the, uh, the grain a bit. People don't like to think that, uh, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks and all of that. But new technology is going to be really helpful in elderly populations, and I really do believe that. Um, but before I get onto that, one last thing is that my master's itself was in neuropsychology, not neuroscience. Uh, and the key difference there is that neuroscience understands that we are all a brain. Neuropsychology occasionally tries to remember that that brain usually has a person attached to it. Um, so to begin with, VR in the public eye. VR, as you will probably understand it, uh, from the Bath Digital Festival, might look a little something like this. Um, Head-mounted displays, movement-based controllers, very cool stuff. This is uh, Beat Saber, if you've ever heard of it, it's a very fun game. I can totally do that, I just don't want to. Um, <laughs> obviously I have no idea how. Um, so you know, very flashy, very cool looking stuff, you know, something out of Tron right now. Uh, you might have seen these treadmill motion capture devices that can transcribe your footsteps into a virtual world and let you literally walk around a virtual reality. Um, yeah, we give you the ability to explore an entirely new world. This is probably what we think of when we think of VR in everyday life, right? That's generally what we think of. Uh, in academia, in papers, in research, the reality is um, a little less exciting. Uh, as you can see from this, in academia we move just, uh, just a little bit more slowly with our understanding of what virtual reality is. And unfortunately, in academia, uh, to the eyes of everyone else, we do occasionally have a little bit of a trip up. <laughs> um, so, on the left here, I have a list of everything that, during my research, has been classified in academia as virtual reality. So, controller-based consoles, the Xbox, the Wii, uh, even the Nintendo Wii is classified as a modern research virtual reality method in papers published at the latest of 2014, sorry, the earliest of 2014. Xbox Connect, smartphone apps, and even a keyboard and mouse intervention are considered virtual reality in research. So, as you can see, academia is quite a bit behind what we might consider to be the cutting edge of technology 
in the actual world with the tech. And the reason for that is the technology moves very, very quickly in a way that academia can't really hope to keep up with. The Nintendo Wii was released in 2006. Does anyone have a Nintendo Wii still? Yes. Yeah? Does anyone play a Nintendo Wii still? No. No. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Uh, no, it's ancient. Would anyone call the Nintendo Wii the cutting edge of anything? <laughs> Certainly of virtual reality. Probably not. In 2010, so four years later, we had the Microsoft Kinect. Remember the one where you are the controller and you can move around as long as you move very, very slowly. Uh, does anyone still use the Microsoft Kinect? You do! Excellent! <laughs> we have one. Um, so again, a relatively old technology. This is nine years old, and consider how far we've come since then. In 2016, we had the Oculus Rift, a head-mounted display that provided affordable, actual virtual reality that you can completely immerse yourself in. In 2017, we have the Nintendo Switch, uh, a very cool console with the uh, motion capture devices, which are much smaller and able to recognize much more sophisticated movements than, than the Nintendo Wii. That brings us all the way to this year, where we have the release of the Oculus Quest. Um, if anyone doesn't know the Oculus Quest, it's essentially the Oculus Rift, but entirely wireless. So you can take that virtual reality experience, take it with you on the bus. But why you would do that, I don't know, but you could live in a virtual reality on your public transport. Um, that's how far we've come in a relatively short amount of time. Now, I know that this is a span of 13 years, but in academia, this is actually not long at all. Um, yeah, um, the Oculus Quest is fantastic, but we won't see any interventions using it for quite some time, certainly not ones that have been falsified by research. And the reason for that... Excuse me. <laughs> there we go. So, Sorry, getting a bit ahead of, ahead of myself. Of all the papers that, we, that I considered, I considered 38 papers in the end, published between 2014 and 2018, that were all attempting to treat someone with stroke or a traumatic brain injury using virtual reality. This is what they call virtual reality. So, nine of them used Microsoft Connect. Seven used the Nintendo Wii. Seven used a glove-based controller. Uh, to sum that up, that's essentially a glove that you strap onto the affected limb, usually in strokes, so the left hand, um, and you use that glove to manipulate a controller or a vir virtual hand in um, a digital interface. Five, use the head-mounted display. So five would be what we would actually classify as virtual reality. Five, use the keyboard and mouse, so the most basic computerized input that you can get. Three, use a mobile or a tablet, so just holding a phone and call that virtual reality. And three, use an entirely bespoke control system. Now I'll go through what one of these looks like a little bit later, uh, because I want to explain that paper in a bit more detail, but this is something that we can't really replicate at all for commercial use. It's something that is very, very specific to the deficit that you're trying to treat. So why is research behind so far? Well, research moves very, very slowly. If you consider all of the steps that need to be taken to uh, develop an intervention, Imagine a new technology is released and that new piece of tech comes out. You then have to choose what you want to do with it for a specific population. So you have to plan how you're going to use that technology. If you want to get funding for a paper, just going up to a board and saying, well, I want to use the Nintendo Switch, isn't really going to get you very far. We all want to use the Nintendo Switch, it's a great console. Um, you have to decide how you're going to use it to actually implement a therapy. And that can take a lot of time. You then have to get ethical approval, which is the one thing holding psychologists back from ruling the world. Um, and again, plunging someone who perhaps has balance issues due to a stroke into a head-mounted display may not be the most ethical thing in the world, so you need to plan forward for that. You then have to get participant recruitment, and in neuropsychology this can be a real problem. Considering that most people have very specific deficits to their brain or their neurology coming from either a stroke or an injury, you need to make sure that your participant population are all similar enough that you can keep the study controlled. If you have someone who has, say for example, um, a balance disorder, you need to make sure that that person is equally as unbalanced as everyone else in the study, and that can be very, very difficult. Um, so it takes a lot of time to recruit participants in uh, neuropsychology. And then on the bottom here we have kind of the standard processes that take a while. So writing up data analysis, peer review and publication process, oftentimes papers will need to go through a review over and over and over again so, until they are published and everyone's happy with it. Now this process can take years, and it's why that we don't see many new interventions using very new technology. Um, even though the Nintendo Switch was released in 2017, none of the papers I considered 
used the Nintendo Switch. I'd like to think that there are interventions being worked on that use it out there at the moment, but unfortunately, uh, we won't know yet because it takes a while to get published. Um, so, let me take you through some of the ways that VR is currently being used. We have full virtual reality, so a head-mounted display that's being used to help people recover from PTSD and mild traumatic brain injury. They took someone who had PTSD following their involvement in Afghanistan. Um, very, a very difficult thing to live with, a lot of emotional trauma involved there. Now, usually, the process for treating PTSD will be a set of graduated exposure therapy, although usually that would be what we call imagined graduated exposure. Um, so, essentially, you ask the, part the participant to attempt to recall the information from that incident uh, a bit by bit by bit by bit, and this eventually helps them build up until they can recall the incident in all of its details without the emotional trauma associated with it. Virtual reality allows them to relive that experience entirely, and I know what you're thinking, that sounds like it's probably one of the worst things you could possibly do to someone who has PTSD. In this case, they took someone with PTSD and they dropped them into a virtual world. They gave them a head-mounted display to simulate the sight. They gave them headphones to simulate the sound. They gave them a controller that felt like a gun, specifically the gun that they had during their tour. And they even used an olfactory replicator to create smells that they would have smelled in that environment. So spices from a market and oil from a tank. They let them relive a combat scenario through virtual reality. They call it virtual Afghanistan. Um, something developed for the military in an attempt to treat PTSD. And they found that this allowed the person to actually relive their experiences without any fear of being hurt. Because it's a virtual world, they knew that they couldn't be hurt. And this actually helped them to pull through the period of emotional trauma and understand that they are safe in this environment. It helped to gain an understanding of that situation. Um, now, of course, this is one case study, and it may not be effective across the board, but it's a very interesting way of using virtual reality. A different study with a different approach took people who had a deficit to stroke, uh, or a deficit to stroke, a deficit to their balance post-stroke, um, and it used the Microsoft Connect to help to restore their balance. Now, again, in this case, traditional therapies use individual elements of functioning individual elements of balance. It will focus on replicating a single movement over and over and over again until it is practiced to perfection. So if someone attempts to move their leg, you need to get them to move their leg forwards and backwards, say, 20 times uh, in a minute to get them to uh, help them to walk appropriately. Now, this doesn't always map well to the real world. It may be one thing to walk down a straight room in a straight line, uh, effectively, but that's not going to help you walk down a busy street. Um, and this is something that virtual reality can help with, because by using a connect game, by distracting participants, getting them to focus on the game, it allows them to move around entirely with their whole body, synchronizing their movements completely in order to understand and regain that control. So rather than just developing individual movements, virtual reality is helping people combine them together in a safe environment. You don't need to put people out on the street to get them to simulate the idea of taking a side step. You can get them to do that in a virtual interface. And then that can be randomized, so that rather than just having them practice side to side over and over again, you can get them to respond to any actual stimulus that comes their way. And that can be really helpful. And the other important thing in this case, Balance was restored, yes. Uh, the improvements were retained. So weeks after they completed the therapy, these people still had better balance than when they started it. But finally, most participants actually enjoyed the process of rehabilitation, um, which is incredible. If anyone here has ever been through uh, movement rehabilitation, um, I, unfortunately I have, it is not fun. Uh, I defy you to find anyone who would tell you that movement rehabilitation is a fun experience. And yet, in this case, people said that they enjoyed playing the games. So, one last study to explain the depth and the range that VR can take us through. So, aphasia is a difficulty in recalling or producing language. Uh, it's relatively common after a stroke when uh, the linguistic areas of the brain are damaged. One study took people who had aphasia and it dropped them into a virtual world. It's called Eva Park. 
a simulated program similar to um, Second Life, if any of you are familiar with that, a completely virtual world that simulates things like a hairdresser or a shop or a pizza takeaway, things like that. By putting these people into this situation, it gives them a chance to practice daily conversations without the fear of being embarrassed or without the fear of being ashamed that they can't remember a word. So it's all well and good trying to remember words on the spot without a virtual reality situation, but if you want to practice ordering a pizza, and let's be honest, that's the first thing you want to regain if you lose your words, then you can practice ordering a pizza in a virtual environment without any fear that the person on the other end of the line is going to not understand you or going to cause issues for you. You can practice in a safe environment. So patients were encouraged to interact with the world uh, fully to the extent that it, um, an election process was actually programmed in. There were four mayoral can candidates in this virtual world. And those candidates went through giving speeches, uh, campaigning in this virtual world. The patients had to then decide who they would vote for and why and explain that. Um, so we can really simulate any process you want through this virtual world. And also, support workers were able to meet with patients in this virtual world. So even though support workers were remote uh, geographically from the people who were in this world, they were able to meet, discuss their progress, discuss the intervention, um, discuss anything they wanted to, and have support provided to them through this virtual interface. Again, providing people with a very interesting way of communicating that they may not have had otherwise. In some cases, people with stroke actually, it's so severe that they're unable to leave their house. And having a support worker be able to visit them virtually might be able to provide them with a little bit more uh, social interaction than they would have before. So, obviously, I believe that VR is the next step. So, you can understand that I'm going to tell you that the conclusion of all these papers is quite simply that virtual reality is the superior... Uh, no, it's not. So, every single one of these papers concluded quite, quite rigidly and with utter certainty that we need more research. Um, and this makes me think, I was called very much an academic when I wrote this paper by, uh, by one of our writers. Um, and I, at first I took that as a compliment, I was like, that's, that's good. Uh, and then I thought to ask why. And when I asked why, she said, well, you can tell you're an academic because you refuse to commit to anything. And I said, well, you can't really conclude that from just one instance, but you know. Um, <laughs> so yes, every single one of them concludes that more research is required. Which is quite a disappointing conclusion. When you're finding such important results, why are we not saying with certainty that virtual reality is a good step? Well, firstly, papers very rarely make a strong recommendation early on in the process. When you're developing a new intervention, it's quite difficult to use one population group and generalize from that group to everyone. In the case of the PTSD study, yes, it was very effective with one individual. It worked very, very well, but it could be quite a reckless procedure to assume that anyone who has PTSD will be able to go into that virtual world and be helped. We need more research, unfortunately. We need more time to explore any possible side effects. One person is not indicative of an entire world of people. Um, secondly, in the case of virtual reality, if you can't prove that these therapies are significantly more uh, effective at treating people, then why bother changing? Each of these papers demonstrated effectively that the virtual reality intervention was as effective as the standard one. Not more effective, just as effective. And if it's only as effective, why bother moving? Virtual reality can be expensive, technology has to be set up, um, and this can be quite frustrating, particularly if you have to provide more training for your staff. So if you can't show that it's a significant leap forward, then the safer bet is to just stick with things as they are currently. Uh, one study often only equals one application. If you are a clinic who treats stroke patients, then traditionally you're going to have a wide range of people with stroke, which means you're going to have a wide range of deficits that you need to, need to treat. One study that considers aphasia is only relevant for aphasia. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, so if you're considering aphasia, then that's very effective. But if you're working with stroke patients as a whole, you're going to have a huge range of people. And one study is never enough to show that you should adopt virtual reality as a whole. You want studies that can show that everything is effective. And finally, there's a tendency to wait for a meta-analysis. Now, a meta-analysis is a research of research. You essentially read all of the papers that you can on a given topic, 
pull their findings together and try to make a more conclusive conclusion from that process. Researchers, particularly practitioners, like to wait for a meta-analysis to prove that all of the research out there is pointing in the right direction. So why do I still believe that virtual reality is the next step forward? Well, like I said here, there can be a tendency to forget that in psychology we are working with people. Um, oftentimes we consider these therapies to be just a, me a mechanism of improving X function. We're improving balance, we're improving arm movement, we're improving language capability. And that's fine, but we need to remember why we're improving these things. We're improving them to make people's lives better at the end of the day. Uh, as cheesy as that sounds, I like to think that's the purpose of psychology as a whole. So we need to remember that there is a kind of a bigger purpose than just trying to treat a specific deficit. Someone who wants to walk might be able to walk down to their local shop. That might be their goal. And if we can enable that, then that's a good thing. So we need to remember the people at the center of this. Um, that being said, unfortunately, uh, I am a qualitative researcher myself. Stats do matter as much as I hate to admit that. If you can't show through stats that something is significantly more effective, then yes, you're going to have difficulty getting it approved, particularly in the NHS. So, if we don't have good stats, if we don't have stats that show that it's the next step forward, what can we use to assess impact and show that VR is more effective? So let me take you through another issue. 225,000 older people often go an entire week without speaking to anyone. Nothing so much as a good morning from someone you pass on your way to work, not even a hello from a cashier at a shop. These people don't say a single word to anyone. More than that, it's thought that 1.4 million people in the UK alone struggle with loneliness. And many of you may have seen, Cadbury's have recently started a campaign with Age UK where they've removed the words from their dairy milk chocolate bars. Um, it's called Donate Your Words, the idea of many people don't get to speak to anyone at all. Now, I can tell you all of the psychological reasons that loneliness is a bad thing, and I will. Um, it increases risks of cardiovascular disease. It, reduces the chance that treatments will be effective. It can even include a heightened risk of cardiovascular dementia. But really, loneliness on its own is insidious for its own reasons. Loneliness is an awful, awful thing that we should be looking to combat on its own as well. And I feel like loneliness often gets overlooked sometimes, which is why this Cadbury's campaign is so great. We need to raise awareness of so many people going for an entire week without saying another word to anyone else. So, I want to take you through one more study that I considered in my research that I think can encapsulate why VR is the next step. How set out, used virtual reality therapy in a tournament between two care homes. Um, and they used a, an example of a bespoke controller, and I wish I had pictures to show you, but the best way I can think to describe it is it's a, a table-based controller. Um, so, people would sit at the table and strap their arm to it, and the process then involved them leaning and balancing the table to control a virtual interface. Now the games they played were things like Breakout, where you had to move a ball around to break blocks, and they do that by manipulating the gravity of the table they're on. Uh, this was designed for people with limb weakness, to get them to strengthen their limbs and get them to use it more effectively. Through two different care homes, they paired people up, and they made sure that one person was always partnered with someone else from a different care home. And these people only ever communicated online, um, but they took part in the games, and their scores were put together in their teams, and it was used as a competition. I think there were four teams in total. It increased the social activity that these people had every day, while also providing their care. And there was hugely positive feedback from everyone who took part in that study. So let me go through it. Uh, so I'll start with some of the lower ones, um, because there are some lower ones. So, with a score of 2.9 out of 5, people said they agreed that playing eight games with an affected arm was easy. Now, as it's rehabilitation, unfortunately it's not really designed to be easy. Um, that is always going to be the case that it will be difficult. It's a challenge to sort of get a limb that doesn't want to move, moving again. Beyond that, we have 2.7 with no pain or discomfort. Again, an unfortunate reality that there will be pain and discomfort in these cases. Um, again, like I say, the limb does not want to move. You are forcing it to move. But some of the more positive things now. Liked the system overall. Not bored while exercising. Again, very important. At least if you can encourage people to actually want to do rehabilitation, they're more likely to do it more, and that's more likely to give them a better effect. 
uh, would encourage others to use it, 4.1. Again, good sign. But none of these are the single most important thing to these people. With all the virtual reality technology in the world, with everything that we can provide, all of this cool tech, all of these interventions to help them, what was the one thing that these people thought was best about this rehabilitation? They enjoyed playing with a partner. With a score of 4.7 from every single person, or, well, average from every single person, a score of 4.7, the single highest opinion score of the entire study. After everything, the one thing they said was that they enjoyed playing to the partner. And I think that sums up why virtual reality can be so impressive and so important um, for therapies, particularly for elderly groups, where there's a chance that these people don't have the opportunity to socialize in this way. So, yes, the benefits of VR. It's not a reduction of cost, unfortunately. It's not a reduction of treatment time. It stays the same. We need to consider what VR technology adds to existing therapies instead of trying to improve on the same model. VR can enable sociality even if you can't leave your home. If you are unable to leave your house, you can still plug into a virtual world and talk to people. Plain and simple. You can get social contact, and in some cases, you can get social contact while doing your normal therapy. And that can improve people's lives to no end, giving them an increased sense of community and an increased sense of sociality. If you consider that most people are trying to rehabilitate for the goal of, say, going down to a local club, to, I don't know, a snooker club, my granddad loved playing snooker at the local snooker club, this can enable them to play, say, for example, a virtual game of snooker with a friend. Consider why these people are doing these things. Why is their goal to go down to the, social, to the snooker club? It could be an intense desire to replay snooker, or it could just be that that's where they're familiar with meeting their friends. And if you can provide a virtual reality therapy that allows them to meet with friends and socialize in that sense, it's likely to be very effective at improving their lives beyond just improving any deficit. And to take you back to what I said at the beginning, um, like I said, with my mother calling me a loser, um, the thing that I think I always understood, whereas my mom saw me sat in a room on my own, playing games, uh, occasionally yelling at the screen because of lag, um, she saw me on my own, just playing games. But I knew, through my headset, I had access to all my friends in the world. I spent every evening talking to my friends, spending most of the time talking to everyone I knew. That social element is often overlooked in virtual reality, and in any digitized therapy. And that is something that I believe that digital therapies can provide. We can increase sociality and we can increase a sense of community. Like I said, the research shows that VR is just as effective as normal therapy. So, really, I believe that it's the next step forward because it's just as effective, but it's improving people's lives in a way that perhaps isn't considered by standard metrics. But it is something that will definitely improve people's lives while they go through the rehabilitation process. So, I think I'm running a little early, believe it or not. Uh, but to finish with a kind of easily digestible soundbite, um, as this is the digital festival. When you design a therapy, you need to think about it in the same way that you would design a virtual world. Yeah. What do they have in common? Well, if you want them to make a therapy or a virtual world great, you need to think carefully about the whole person that you put at the center of it. Uh, thank you for listening. Jed, um, do we have any questions that we'd like to, to ask Jed uh, based on the stuff he's said today at all? By the way. Um, so, if you see the future of, sort of care and rehabilitation going towards VR, mm -hmm. how do you think some of those barriers to implementing it will be overcome? So, things like the cost and training staff? So, I think, again, it's another issue of time. The more time goes on, uh, the cheaper technology gets and the more effective the technology that is cheaper gets. So it's so much easier now. I mean, I haven't looked, but I imagine you could pick up a Nintendo Wii relatively cheaply, uh, much more cheaply than you could when it was first released. Um, with the rate that technology is advancing, I don't believe that it'll be too long before it's fairly cheap and easy to just pick up an Oculus Rift. So I believe that, I think as time goes on, it will become much easier to get this tech into these situations for a cheaper amount. And also, um, in terms of actual usage, 
um, the more people kind of grow up with tech, the more inherent kind of understanding people have of technology. So I think tech literacy is only going to increase in the world as a whole. So I think that that will really help as well, getting more people who understand how to use tech in these situations as well. Um, the people you mentioned that were playing partners, mm. did they have a head mounted display on? Uh, no, actually. So in this case, again, um, I'm afraid I pulled the sneaky one on you. Uh, it's not actual virtual reality. It, in that case, um, they were playing in partners on a table, and it was actually, if you can imagine this sort of setup, they were sat in front of a big screen that had a simulation of a table that they were then moving, uh, that coincided with the movements of the table they were using. So again, not an actual head mounted display, but something that they could just look at. Yes. Um, top three interventions, loneliness, um, dementia, and um, disability. Yeah, yeah I, I believe so. Um, of course, it's used in so much more than that as well. There's a lot of cases of using virtual reality, for example, for pain reduction. Um, when redressing burn victims, uh, you can put people in a virtual world that's covered in ice, and they play a game where they throw snowballs at snowmen while redressing the burns, and it helps to kind of distract people from the reality that they are in, and can help kind of just take the mind away. Uh, there's a similar intervention with children who need to take injections, where there's a, a virtual figure that kind of hits them with a magic wand at the time that the doctor administers the injection, and it just helps kind of take the mind away from the imagery of a painful injection or something painful. So I think virtual reality can be applied hugely but yes, absolutely, as a neuropsychologist, I would argue that dementia in particular is an excellent usage of it, and these other therapies that can uh, yeah, enable sociality. And are there any live trials going on out in, um, uh, in care homes right now? There are um, quite a few more papers that are kind of in the works at the moment. Um, a few have yet to be published, but again, the amount of research that kind of goes on is a lot. <laughs> Um, but unfortunately it's kind of not very centralized, so a lot of people are doing a lot of similar things in different places, so it takes a while for research to kind of sync up. So I'm hoping that soon we'll be able to see kind of a, a strong sort of movement uh, sweeping across. Um, but I know that there are quite a few uh, companies that are providing this sort of therapy. Um, in fact, tomorrow one of them is uh, called VR Therapies, and they'll be here at the Advantage. Uh, we have a client who deals a lot with people with dementia and they provide mental health facilities for them in particular. Um, we looked a lot at some research where they kind of stimulated uh, streets and things for them to walk back and to you know, bring back some memories. But we're struggling quite a lot with the actual headset with people with dementia. There's a lot of claustrophobia around here and being touched and it's not going down particularly well. But do you think the immersive experience is going to move forward to come away from that a little bit? I, I think so, yeah, actually. Um, and again, going back to you know, considering the difference between the Oculus Rift and the Oculus Quest, um, the Quest is so much lighter and it doesn't feel like you're wearing as much on your head. And I think, yeah, again, as technology moves forward, I, I hope that it will only get easier to wear and move around in. Um, but I, I can see that that is a real problem. But yeah, I hope that the technology we have can get smaller and smaller and smaller and more compact until eventually it's just something that you can wear ideally as easy as wearing glasses or something, which will be a, an experience a lot more familiar to uh, these people. Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm hoping it's going to make sense. It's just trying to work out the question ahead. But um, obviously you said that like, the therapy impact is the same. Um, is there any work in terms of like, like scalability? Obviously there's a heavy upfront cost, right? Big yes. investment, but obviously the kind of automation and things like that, and then we might not necessarily be up front with the actual end user, but operations efficiencies, yeah. being able to deliver new scenarios to, to different care homes, things like that, that might end up being more of a financial saving, right? Yeah, uh, definitely, and um, there are some there were some papers that I reviewed that I haven't included in this uh, talk, but one, for example, looked at providing uh, people who were ho housebound with these systems, and they were sent therapeutic practices each day. So exactly that, yeah, while there might be a bit of an upfront cost, that technology can be adapted through software, and we can develop new... A new Netflix, right? <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, yeah. Netflix for care homes. Um, but yes, exactly, and 
in these cases as well, there's another saving as well that um, we can touch on, which is the savings of support workers' time. So in the case of a virtual support worker, if you consider someone who has to do, say, five house calls in the morning, they have to spend a bit of time at one place, then they have to travel to the next place, and then spend time there, and then travel to the next place. Assuming, in an ideal world, that you can get everyone into this virtual environment, mm -hmm. the travel time between each client can be as simple as log on, log off, log on. And the emissions. Yeah. Yeah, I think a bit of an upfront cost, but in terms of scaling it over time, I think it would be a saving. Yeah. In terms of the, the claustrophobia kind of issues, mm -hmm. and you know, older people we work with aren't used to this idea of having you know, something enclosed. Yeah. Um, are there any suggestions that you might be able to kind of um, scale up rather than scale down? So maybe use like a, a mini tent with projectors kind of thing so that people could, could walk in there without having headsets and stuff but still have the immersive. Yeah, um, I think that would be possible as well. And it's um, it comes down to this idea of kind of VR versus AR as well, like augmented reality. Mm. And you can use uh, projectors on the wall to enable these experiences as well. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think that would be a possibility as well. Um, there are some really interesting studies going on at the moment to kind of get around this idea of having a weighty headset, um, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting directions you can take it. And um, because, again, it's, it's not being used very commercially at all at the moment. So I think there are going to be some really exciting developments as people try out new technologies and just see what works. I think I'm very excited to kind of see what